Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Japan's conquests in Asia during the late 19th and early 20th century had very material objectives to secure resources and extend Japan's power and influence. There is no denying Japanese imperialism inflicted great hardship upon its victims, and Korea in particular. Japan took great care, however, in justifying its actions from a legal and normative perspective. The goal was to convince the Western great powers of the time that Japan was a civilized nation, one of them, and should be treated accordingly. It was no longer a land to conquer, but a fellow colonial power. From a social Darwinist perspective, Japan's decision to engage in colonization was a deliberate strategy to avoid the fate of countless other nations that had fallen under Western imperialism and, in a single word, survive. Professor Alexis Duden is our guest for this episode. She wrote extensively about the discourses and legal rationales that Japanese scholars and government officials relied on to justify the takeover and subsequent colonization of its neighboring countries, with a focus, of course, on Korea. She published two seminal books, Japan's Colonization of Korea, Discourse and Power in 2005, which provided the groundwork for this interview, and more recently, Troubled Apologies Among Korea, Japan, and the United States in 2008. She is currently working on her third book, Islands, Empire, Nation, A History of Modern Japan, under contract with Oxford University Press. Professor Duden received her BA from Columbia University and her PhD in history from the University of Chicago. She has published in various academic journals and news outlets, including the Journal of Asian Studies, Dissent, at the New York Times. Professor Duden, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you very much for having me. How did you become interested in Japanese studies and the colonization of Korea in particular? Excellent question. It was a complete accident. I first uh, went to Japan in high school for a summer, and I wanted to be a geologist when I grew up. So I studied geology and volcanoes, and then I realized that politics were a little more where I was headed. More explosions? More explosions, so I picked the Japan-Korea relationship. And actually, I first came to Korea as a student as well, but in college to go hiking. And while Korea has fewer volcanoes than Japan, the hiking is excellent, and I ended up deciding to learn this language too. Uh, You write about uh, disputes between Korea and Japan from an outsider's perspective, obviously. Do you perceive yourself as neutral, and is it even possible to remain neutral? I don't think it's possible to be neutral once you begin to realize several things at once. Uh, First and foremost, history is subjective. While you can deal with documents and artifacts in an objective manner, analyzing critically and dispassionately, inevitably you take a position. And so in that sense, you become, as a, as a writer of history, part of the story that you're telling. Insofar as an outsider, that works in some sense as an American outsider, but not really. Insofar mm. as even in 1905, with the, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt's blessing, Korea ceased to exist in terms of the international community in the Portsmouth Treaty. Fast forward to 1945, and while the United States is not responsible for the so-called Yoksa Munje that everybody is arguing about in the region, certainly by being the architect of the post-1945 terms in the room, the United States has become itself very much part of the scene and very Mm. much part of Japan-Korea relations and also Japan-Korea-Korea relations. So as an American, I'm definitely involved. Mm. If you don't mind this question, Did you ever uh, have to face a dismissive attitude towards your work, first because you're a foreigner and second because you're a woman and this field is very dominated by men? Did I ever or do I still? Uh, Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. Mm. And, um, you know, depending on the topic, depending on the moment, the social moment in which one produces a piece of history, Uh, One is either pro or anti this or that, given current conditions. In terms of being female, it's interesting. Uh, In Japan, it is actually a little easier to be a female academic 
in my own experience than in Korea. However, at the same time as a female historian studying Japan-Korea relations, it is easier for me to speak with various government officials about relations here vis-a-vis -vis Japan than it is in Japan. I don't know why that is, but mm. I find the political world a little more open to women here. Oddly, I'm sure every Korean woman would disagree with me, but at least as an outsider, that feels more the case. Academia, yeah, it's still a man's world. So today our topic is the Japanese colonization of Korea. Could you give us, as a starter, especially for those who are not familiar with that specific period of Korea's history, a very short overview of the time frame and maybe the central elements uh, to it? Sure. The rough chronology is 1875 to 1945, beginning with the bombing of Kangwa Island, the so-called Unyo incident, and I'll be really, really short, but uh, effectively, the new Japanese government, the Meiji government, set out in a sort of defensive uh, offense insofar as it was clear to the young Meiji officials that imperialism was the name of the game in international politics of the late 19th century. And Meiji officials were very concerned that Japan not become China and be carved up by uh, Western imperial powers. And so they set out to recreate Japanese governance in a way that would engage with the Western imperialist nations and define Japan among them. Korea was very much part of that larger project for Japan. And it's something that is important to think about now, especially as we talk about reconciling. Insofar as, yes, Korea and Japan have a long history of war and engagement and occupation, but it wasn't only Korea that Japan set out to conquer at the time. It began with uh, its largest island today, Hokkaido in the north, is Japan's first colony, then moves to Okinawa, the Ryukyu Kingdom, moves to Taiwan, moves to Korea. Korea perhaps then becomes the most significant first phase of empire for Japan because it's a whole-scale takeover and occupation in ways that the other three places had less of a standing system of governance and society. But it meshed with Japan's larger project, which was to rewrite its own nation as mm. an imperialist power. So fast forward to how it did this. Uh, significantly, it engaged with the law of nations, international law. And this is something that Chinese officials they knew about, but they didn't feel necessary for China because in their mind, China was the center of the, of the world. And so Chinese law should be good enough for everyone. And this is where the Japanese officials are really creative in that they recognize that in order for Japan to make sense with the international community of the day, they needed their words to make sense and they needed their laws and their finance structure, etc., to make sense. So it's part and parcel of the industrial program that Japan engages. And in that, Korea is taken over swiftly, and its takeover process is uh, legible. It makes sense to French projects in Algeria. It makes sense to British projects in uh, Burma, in India, and American projects in the Philippines. This does not make it just or fair. In fact, it was quite a brutal takeover, the takeover of Korea, as most colonial occupations were. But what it was is a very much central moment in that once Japan announced the annexation of Korea into the burgeoning empire of Japan in 1910, it set itself as having a foothold on the continent. And then it would continue its march up into what would become the Manchukuo Manchuria new territory uh, by the 1930s. Mm. I think one of the main premises of your book published in 2005, Japan's Colonization of Korea, Discourse and Power, is that Japan, as you mentioned, took great care to frame its intervention as compatible with international law and worked really hard to justify its actions. Um, so could you maybe um, tell us about the rhetoric that Japan employed to justify its behavior? How, how did it come about? Sure. The best examples are the terms independence and sovereignty. It's really important to understand that, of course, all the nations in this region 
had a notion of kingship, rulership, but the terms independence, sovereignty, that come out of you know the Westphalian system that was alien to this region, these very words become neologisms first in Japanese in the 1870s, and in that first treaty between Japan and Korea in 1876 to deal with Japan's bombardment of Kangwa mm. Island, Japan declares Korea independent. It has no real effect on Korean lives or the Choson system of rule at the time. The Chinese, most importantly, don't really pay any attention because their suzerainty system is still very much mm. in play. But 20 years later, in signing the Shimonoseki Treaty, for example, to, to end the war between Japan and China, the Japanese, in that, make the Chinese recognize Korean independence, and the, the word itself is acknowledged in the term. Japan also has the clever strategy in that treaty, 1895, of announcing that English will be the common international legal language of Asia, which has obviously zero historic precedent, precedent in the region, but becomes a way for Japan to dislodge China as the definer of power mm -hmm. in very practical terms, because for so long, Chinese officials could say to Japanese officials or Korean officials or Annamese officials, oh, no, you don't understand what that Chinese character really means. Um, why was legality so important for Japan? Well, several reasons. It, it wasn't the law as such as an expression of power. Japan's leaders, they, again, they had just sort of had evolution in 1868, a reweaving literally translates the Ishin, overthrowing the Tokugawa shogunate and putting the emperor in a newly defined central position of power. So they move from a totally different system of governance into what would make sense with France and England mm -hmm. and eventually have a constitution of its own. And so it's not so much the, the sort of hyper-legalistic details that matter as a discursive way of making sense in the world community lest Japan itself become colonized as the rest of Asia eventually was. And it's something that, you know, I sort of always begin a semester teaching by saying, look, Japan is the only nation in Asia that emerges as the imperialist and not colonized. And it's something to think about. Do I think that law is the reason that Japan was not colonized? No, but it, hmm. it is of a piece with Japan's decision to develop a Western style military to industrialize. And, you know, a lot of that was just these were choices that the young officials made in the 1860s and 70s, which you know caused enormous social dislocation in Japan, but set Japan on a path of mimicking, but not in it. It's a difficult word to use because I don't mean that there was no creativity among Japanese leaders, but it certainly made their actions reflexive with imperialist uh, sensibilities in Europe and eventually the United States. So is it fair to say that the legal aspect was almost as important to Japan as the material motives for a colonizing? I argue that it mm -hmm. is. Not everybody agrees, but I guess it's it's not a an either or or a hierarchy to me insofar as, no, I mean, Japanese needed resources to fuel the empire that they had set up a descriptive set of words for. And certainly defining a war as a legitimate war, as J Japanese legal scholars would strive to do in their first war against China, in the war against Russia, didn't win the war. Mm. The bullets won the war. But it was necessary to do both because the language of civilization, the rhetoric of civilization coming out of England and France, especially at the time, would, by all other accounts, have defined Japan as among a people to be colonized, not capable of becoming imperialists themselves. Was this part of Japan's drive to become accepted among Western nations and become one of their peers, so to speak, to be part of this standard Absolutely. of civilization of the time? Because um, you write in your book that Tokyo lawmakers saw it as crucial to create a national narrative 
And of course, if you have a lack of rule, a lack of destiny, that means that you're probably ripe for colonization. Absolutely. Uh, it was part of Japanese officials' determination to refashion their country into a modern nation that would make sense in the so-called great powers of the day. And it's really through, I would argue, the colonization of Korea and the success whether I mean success is a, you know it's a strange word to use because the brutality mm. that sustained that success is critical to understand at the same time but Japan's swift eradication of Korea as a separate place and its incorporation of it into the Japanese empire made the west stand up and take notice on top of their defeat of Russia you know the the sort of the those two went hand in hand. 1905's defeat in Russia even appears in Ulysses James Joyce. Excuse me, in in James Joyce's mm. Ulysses because this is something that really stunned the white world and the the racial language was used very much. You know how could these so-called little yellow people defeat? the Russian Navy. Well, they did because they had a really good Navy. And the Russians didn't take the battles seriously until it was too late. So, you know, there, there was a lot of shock. And then, you know, as then the century begins to unfold and the Japanese have set up their initial expanding sphere, Hokkaido, Taiwan, Ryukyu, Taiwan, Korea, at the time that Europe is about to be engulfed in the First World War. Mm. And so there's a sort of turning away of interest in Asia, not a disregard, but preoccupation with what's happening uh, at home. And it's in that, you know, following 1914 through, say, 1924, that Japan really establishes its control of these early colonial territories in Northeast Asia, but also at the same time takes advantage of its siding with the Allies in World War I to gain the, the so-called Nanyo, the South Seas territories, mm -hmm. which they get by siding with the Allies against Germany. So those become the, the Saipan and Tinian Micronesian territories that had been under German and uh, other you know, Spanish control. So to put it very bluntly, is it fair to say that the colonization of Korea at the time was seen as progress in the sense that now Japan was participating in Asia's mission civilisatrice, to use the French term? Sure, and the Japanese set up a mission, mission legislatrice, mm. as I try to argue. But progress is a tricky word, right? Because this progress is going to involve massacres and the enslavement and forced labor of hundreds of thousands and millions of Asians. So from the Western perspective, the newspaper reporters could not have been clearer. The Japanese were going to finally uplift and civilize the natives of these, these lands. This is the language in the newspapers of France and Germany, England and the United States. But the trick and the reason I'm hedging on the word progress is now, today, but especially beginning in the 1990s when the history problems really began to emerge as political issues in this region, the Japanese apologism, their sort of self-defense, is that the colonization brought progress. So if you want to measure that in terms of establishing centralized education and hospitals and ordered roads, yes, you know, the Japanese certainly did that. They, you know, brought banking systems. Mm. This is not something that has not benefited many of the regions in this, this area. But that's where it gets into a tricky problem of how a Japanese denialist view of its empire would be washed away by continuing a civilizational understanding of what happened, which really, I think, in many other parts of the world, especially when you look at the contents of the 2001 Durban Statement, right? I mean, that was a post-colonial moment of formerly colonized people coming together and saying, yes, we understand that we have hospitals because the French took us over, but we still need to deal with having hmm. been taken over. And so 
today in 2015 as students and teachers it's important because we can we have the materials here we all are studying in Seoul we have the ability to see all sides at once in a way that in 1945 and certainly in 1905 we couldn't have hmm. in a sense Japan took a social Darwinist point of view and decided that to survive as an independent actor had to become Western mm -hmm. uh, industrialized militarized colonized Something that China and Korea fail to understand. Is, is that a fair assessment of the power play in, in East Asia in the late 19th century that someone got what was going on and the others did not? Well, actually, the Koreans and the Chinese were very aware mm. that they were being taken over and brutalized. There's some you know, really powerful writings, uh, really powerful political cartoons in both Korea and China at the time. The problem is they didn't have a military. You know, I mean, so it really does come down to power in the barrel of a gun. Plus, eventually, the Western countries backed Japan. Uh, they benefited from Japan's continuing to make unease in Korea and dislocating, and then they just decided that it was easier to let Japan have Korea outright. But that's why in those early years, up through annexation in 1910, and even slightly after, the Japanese officials are daily conscious and daily nervous about how their efforts are being perceived in Western capitals because they know factually that they're not able to withstand, say, a French bombardment. But mm. because the French eventually just take Indochina and the British are content with their treaty ports in China and Burma and Malaya, you know, it comes down to just how, how far can you expand your empire? you know, who the Americans began to get in on the game, too, at this juncture. And so, you know, Pearl Harbor was not an accident, right? I mean, that was not quite an American state yet. That was an American annexed territory in the same terminology that Korea was. Hmm. Uh, so, yes, the Koreans and Chinese were aware that they were being taken over. They just didn't have the collective ability to resist the brutality of the Japanese takeover, as well as the Japanese industrial machine. You know, Korea was just a completely different landscape in the 1870s and, you know, through annexation. So yes, there was a resistance movement here, but it was much, much smaller than, than anything that could have stood as a viable contest with Japan. But unlike China and Japan, who tried to, to play the system, didn't Korea push back directly against the West? To quote Bruce Cummings, the Taewon Gun had a simple foreign policy, no treaties, no trade, no Catholics, no West, and no Japan. Yes, I couldn't mm. agree more. However, that wasn't true of everybody else in Korea, and so... The Taewon Gun had one approach, but then Queen Min had her factions and different rulers, and then mm -hmm. Kojong would be playing off other powers, and so the Russians and the Japanese and the Chinese and the Americans and the French and the English all figured out that they could start manipulating the ruling powers to do one thing versus another. In the meantime, the Japanese were demonstrating you know, how to have a modern army by stationing troops in Seoul. And so the Koreans uh, under Emperor Kojong established the first modern army. However, it's disbanded in 1907 because the Japanese force its disbanding and they also, and they also take the Korean coffers so that they can't pay the troops. So the troops just leave. Hmm. So it becomes a, a moment in which the Western powers do begin to do in Seoul what the Western powers were doing in China, which was the divide and conquer approach within a very small number of people ruling the country. Something that's also important to consider is the intense divide of the class system in Korea at the time. You know, we're not talking about the Korea of today. Mm. We're talking about a Korea that was intensely stratified. There were ruling families, there were Yangban officials, and then there were the peasants and slaves. So this is not a natural national identity. And here's where the work of Andre Schmidt is really useful because he's showing that in the 1897 to 1910 moment, it's in that juncture that young men, just like the three of you, but without you know all the gadgets we have today, but the same questions and the same interest in governance, 
we're figuring out you know how to be a modern nation and coming up with new names for the country so we have Tehan you know we have the great empire the empire of great Korea come in as a new word here as opposed to the Joseon dynasty but just as that consciousness of national formation and identity is coming into being the Japanese are taking over and they simply you know, just because you have this great idea of national identity, until you have the internal social revolution to have all Koreans believe that they are the same national people, it's not a natural resistance. We focus so far on Japan's appeal to international law, but they were not the only ones. Korean authorities also attempted to protect themselves from Japanese influence through international law. And you mentioned your book most famously in 1907, Emperor Kojong tried to make foreign powers recognize Korea's perpetual neutrality during the Second Hague Conference. This movement, however, failed and became a turning point in Japan's gradual takeover of the Korean Peninsula. Can you maybe tell us what happened on that fateful day in The Hague and what was the purpose of the conference and why was it so disastrous? Yes, the Second International Conference on Peace had been delayed by several wars and these were among the first arms reduction conferences Mm. because in the the wake of the Franco-Prussian War and increasing awareness of what new weaponry could do, the leaders, particularly the Russian Tsar, called for an arms reduction conference. And so the first conference is held in, I believe it's 1897, and they're negotiating how to get rid of these terrible weapons which are currently being invented and introduced to modern warfare. and. In the mix, the second conference is planned and again postponed, but it is held ultimately in the summer of 1907 to great fanfare so that the so-called civilized nations of the world can continue to justify their own civilization by justifying themselves as the civilized nations of the world. And in that moment, Emperor Kojong sends his, his emissaries to protest Japan's increasing takeover or its evisceration of Korea's domestic ruling structure. Because while the 1905 uh, protectorate agreement with Japan took away Korea's foreign relations, what the Japanese did in the wake of that was begin to do things like take away Korea's control over its finances, take Hmm. away Korea's control over its military, take away Korea's control over its telecommunications. So they were gutting it from within before the 1910 official annexation. In that mix, Ko Jong wants to protest and say, we are an independent entity and need to be recognized. The problem is the United States in particular had already erased Korea from the list of world nations. In 1906, the United States Congressional Record of Foreign Relations shifts Korea from its a separate category and puts it under Japan. So when the emissaries show up in The Hague, like countless other colonized and about to be colonized peoples of the world, in addition to several indigenous groups that show up to protest, they're simply not allowed in the room. And so it becomes a moment of real awakening among officials here. And it's in the wake of that effort Mm. that the Oibyeong resistance movement is born at home, the Righteous Army, because Japan's troops move in increasingly when they realize that the the so-called great powers that self referentially defined great powers of the day are taking Japan's side. So it's, you know, it's not for lack of trying. At the same time, also, Korea's first scholar of international law, Ho Wee, possibly the most difficult name for me to pronounce, sorry, um, (laughs) he is trying, appealing to all the foreign legations in Seoul to define Korea's resistance to Japan as a legitimate war of Korea versus Japan. But nobody pays attention. None of the the foreign diplomats stationed in Seoul don't recognize his claims, even though he's using the very terminology that he's learned Hmm. of an independent sovereign state fighting a legitimate war of national defense. His treatises are not recognized, and the Japanese find out who he is, throw him in jail, and he dies there. The Protector Treaty between Japan and Korea uh, was was signed by Korean ministers and not by Emperor Kojong himself. So how could your treaty be considered legitimate at all? And why did Korea fail to win such a legitimacy battle against Japan? It is a forced treaty, Hmm. and it 
by many accounts, if we were measuring it today, would be illegitimate. If Korea had international recognition in 1905, should have been recognized as illegitimate. But this is back to where international law is a language of power. And here it's very important to consider that treaty similar to other treaties of takeover, again, France and Algeria, countless examples of nations that cease to exist because international law defines their rulers or their governance as not civilized. So in that moment, the self-defining pieces of international law come into play. So yes, it's a forced treaty, but it was not recognized as such outside. So international law has these two faces. Actually, sovereignty works both ways this way, Mm. too. You have domestic legitimacy to rule, but you have to have external recognition of your rule. And nobody was taking Korea's side outside of Korea. So it unfortunately then worked to Japan's benefit for Koreans, that is, it unfortunately works to Japan's benefit that they've done such a good job presenting themselves as civilized. And so it's in that moment that the Korea falls to Japanese rule, very similarly to how the Hawaiian kingdom falls to American rule, um, and so forth and so on. And so because Japan was perceived as civilized, it allowed the West to somehow justify their decision to support Japan over Korea, because Japan was compatible with the the zeitgeist of international society of the time. Yes, exactly. And also Japanese officials uh, in Korea were savvy enough to know that it was a good idea to make business deals with a variety of American companies, a variety of British companies, and also, you know, they were most deeply nervous about American missionary presence. My favorite are looking through all the Japanese diplomatic exchanges over, is this son of heaven, is he, is, is the son of God going to compete with the emperor of Japan? You know, they're deeply nervous about the language of Christianity that the missionaries are spreading, but then they figure out which missionaries are going to work with them. And so, you know, the history of the Presbyterian Church here is deeply connected to the fact that the Japanese allowed many of its missionaries to stay throughout the colonial era, for better or for worse, but this is how, you know, these these structures stayed in place. So it had, you know, the Japanese, they didn't purge the country of all Western foreigners, but this was, this was still a very small population of, of Westerners that chose to stay in Korea as opposed to China in particular, where there was much more money to be made. Mm. And so if they could you know, work with a variety of Japanese companies to figure out how to make money off of Korea, fine. But in general, that fell to the, the Japanese companies that set up here. And then you know, other territories farther in Southeast Asia were completely controlled by European powers. One of the major points of contention is, of course, the signature of the 1910 Treaty of Annexation of Korea. The Koreans argued that it was illegal because their emperor king at the time did not sign the treaty, but that the deed was rather done by then prime minister of the Korean Empire, while the Japanese say it followed the Western practice of the time. So can you maybe tell us more about it and why is this treaty so important and was it in any way legitimate? It did both. Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yong, who is often bears the epithet traitor for life in Korean textbooks, in fact signed the document and it should have been. Well, the problem is the Japanese had already thrown Ko Jong off the throne by that point, so it's Sun Jong. And technically, as the leader of Korea, yes, of course it should have been his seal on the document. But it didn't matter by that point. The Western world had already come to understand that Japan controlled Korea. At that moment, without Western military intervention to rid the Korean peninsula of Japanese, or as had been the practice more recently in Korean history, Chinese military intervention, it falls into the category of how Egypt fell, how Mm. Algeria fell, how Morocco fell. And so at that state, it's very important to recognize that the West legitimated the Japanese colonization of Korea. There is one French legal scholar who continues to protest for several years, but he is the only one. 
And so in that effort, it's to me more important to understand that the Japanese had created this appearance of legitimacy just as the other nations that were taking over places around the world created appearances of legitimacy to justify the brutality that was at stake in the name of civilization. So yes, today, if the government of Japan wanted to say, you know, you're right, <laughs> it really was an illegitimate treaty, that would be a game changer. That's highly unlikely. Mm. And that was actually sort of what the Durban conference was about in 2001. It was an effort for formerly colonized peoples around the world to reclaim their history in a sense of, of dignity. But it really wasn't going to change what had happened. How did Japanese policymakers at the time frame the treaty in terms of international law? And was it any different from the justifications they used before, uh, such as for the Protector Treaty of 1905? It was wildly heralded. And remember, it comes a year after Resident General Ito Hirobumi has been assassinated in Harbin. And so uh, the fact that they graduated from a resident general to a governor general. Again, these are terms new in Japanese. They're completely copied from the French, which really for many Japanese legal scholars became the model, which mm. is why I keep talking about the French here. But one, one legal scholar in particular, Ariga Nagao, was Japan's most important international, scholar, or international legal scholar. And he deeply studied how the French created their empire because he found it to be the one that would be most resonant with Japanese experience. And the fact that he figured out how to do it in a way that would engage Japan's projects made it make sense. From today's perspective, what are the official positions of the Japanese and Korean governments about the legality of these moves, and what does international law um, say about it? The Korean government continues to hold that this was illegitimate, illegal, forced, and the Japanese government continues to maintain that it upheld the standards of the day. Mm. Both are true. Both do not get any closer to delving into the histories that happened. So it, that is honestly why in my book I tried to say, okay, you know, let's accept these treaties as legitimate, but let's study what constitutes legitimacy. Because in that, you can see that legitimacy is not the same thing as justice. Professor Duden, to conclude, what role does this question play in the discourse between the two countries on their shared history, and is there a diverging opinion in academia? There's a diverging uh, opinion in academia, not just you know in each of the countries involved, but it, it has particular import to the moment in which we find ourselves today, the 50th anniversary of normalization, because between South Korea and Japan, because that treaty begins by declaring the 1910 treaty null and void doesn't declare the history of what happened empty, however, and it's the legacies of those histories that are still living on the streets of Seoul and Tokyo today, and throughout, throughout Japan, throughout Korea, that continue to inform how people approach. So back to your very first question, is it possible to be objective? Of course not, because today in 2015, somebody from 1930 can reach out and grab me and mm -hmm. say, no, this is what happened. They took my name away. Now, that doesn't mean that the treaty was formed in a different way, but it's incumbent, therefore, in the present to recognize what happened in that system. Professor Duden, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you very much for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.